to accept it. Secrets of New York City School Admissions with Alina Adams, author of the ebook Getting into New York City Kindergarten. My name is Victoria Chapman, and I will be helping facilitate this conversation. How are you doing, Alina? I'm good, and I'm ready to talk about all the latest developments in New York City kindergarten admissions, and there are a lot of them. Wow. Okay. Well, it's been a while. We took a little bit of a break, and we're coming back. Now, back in the fall and the winter, we covered... Oh my goodness, oh so many things. Um, how to apply to your local zone public school, how to apply to private school, the difference between citywide and district gifted program. What else? We talked about charter schools, we talked about traditional versus progressive schools, we talked about what to do if your child has special needs, and most importantly, we talked about everything you should be doing starting now and going all the way through to the September when your child would start kindergarten. Okay, so that's a brief catch up on where we have been. Now, first, I understand your book, Getting Into New York City Kindergarten, has been updated? It has. I've gone through and I've created a new edition for parents who will be applying children for 2017. Yes, 2017, you have to start now. I've updated all the links to the forms that you need. I've updated the dates. Now, once again, as we learned last year, the DOE, the Department of Ed, will put out a date and tell you that this is when forms are due and then halfway through the process change it. But as close as I can to uh, matching the correct dates now I have done. So the new book has the new dates. It has the new links to all the new forms. And it also has links to various studies and things that have happened since the first edition was put out. Okay, great. Now where can you get the book? You can get the book on Amazon. You can get the book on Barnes and Noble. And then once you have the book, you can sign up for the mailing list where I will keep you updated even quicker on all of the changes as they unfold. Okay. And if you've bought the book for 2016 or even 2015... Well, the new edition for 2017 is a new book, so you have to buy it again. Okay, okay. But if you're on the mailing list, you're also getting updated along the way. Right, if you're on the mailing list, you're getting those emails. Okay, now, I understand we've got a lot of New York City school news. Um, In the last couple of weeks, early April, parents got their children's gifted and talented scores. They did. And um, I understand there were more kids qualifying this year? Yes. As always, every year we're told that we have a new test that will make it harder to qualify. And every year more kids qualify. This year is no exception. We have over a thousand kids who scored in the 99th percentile, which is the absolute highest score you can get. And those kids can apply for citywide gifted schools, of which there are only about 300 seats. Some of them will go to siblings. So really we're talking about even if your child scored in the 99th percentile. Even if they didn't miss a single question, you are not guaranteed a spot in a gifted citywide school. So what's that mean for for parents who've got these wonderfully gifted kids? It means that they really have to consider all of their other options. But the problem is some parents are not even particularly interested in a gifted and talented school. They might love their local zoned school. But the problem is in the best zoned schools, there are wait lists. So you can live in the neighborhood. You can live across the street from a school. I have one family that can literally look from their window into the backyard of a school, but they are waitlisted and they can't go to their local school. So for those families, the gifted and talented scores are important because what happens is once the gifted and talented scores come out and people apply to gifted and talented schools and people are told what gifted and talented school they've been accepted to, they then give up a spot in their general education school. So that's why the gifted and talented results are important even to parents who didn't apply their children for gifted and talented. Okay. Quick aside. If you are have a gifted, have a gifted and talented child, but you go to a general education school, what can you do to foster some of that gifted and talentedness? Well, there's all sorts of things that you can do with your child. You can go to museums. You can read books to them. Some parents choose to go into a dual language program, which basically means that the child is learning half the day in English, half the day in another language. There are charter schools that teach a particular area of interest, perhaps better than a general ed school. There are magnet schools that also teach a particular area of interest. So you do have quite a lot of choices. And that's actually one of the reasons that I love doing this podcast is I want parents to know that, yes, you might want your general ed school. Yes, your child might have qualified for gifted and talented, but you are not guaranteed any of those things. And you really should be exploring all of your other options. Wow. Love that. 
Options always a good thing. Now you mentioned the wait list. Um, how is a parent supposed to navigate that? This is a big waiting time, isn't it? It is. And really, at this point, there's nothing parents can do beyond call the parent coordinator, express your interest, stress that you would really like to go to that school, stress what you might have to con- um, contribute to the school. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about things like maybe you're an artist who can teach an art class. Maybe you're a musician who can come and lead a sing-along. Maybe you work at a museum and can get the kids a behind the scene tour maybe you work at the UN and can bring people into a general session basically schools want families that want to be there so any way that you can convey your interest to show that you want to be at that school you're going to rise to the top of the queue because here's something very important to remember the first initial assignment that is done by the de- Department of Ed is centralized but then the waiting lists go back to the schools and the schools manage their own wait lists mm-hmm. so any parent that shows higher interest than someone else has a better shot. Also remember, the people in administration do not want to spend their whole summer making phone calls, asking people, oh, do you want to come to the school? Oh, you already took a seat somewhere else. Do you want to come to the school? So (laughs) if you can tell them that if they call you, you will accept that spot right away and make their life easier, you will jump to the head of the queue. This is not a piece of information you're going to find listed officially anywhere, but anecdotally, that's what happens. And what about if you know a parent um, who already has a child at the school? That's great. If you could get a parent at the school to come in and once again vouch for you, A, to say that you're a great family, B, to say that you could be a great contribution to the community, but most importantly, C, that you will accept the spot the minute they call, you're going to be a very popular parent. You're going to be on the special internal wait list. Okay. All right. Now, um, that I understand, some of them are popular schools in New York. Once again, um, they have their wait list, but not for just kids outside of their zone, but for families inside the zone. Yes. That's the thing to remember is that when you look at how many kids are waitlisted, the DOE put out a list of how many kids are waitlisted at each school. Keep in mind that that number is just of kids in the zone. That doesn't mean all the kids who have applied for it. That just means kids in the zone that are waitlisted. So if you think that, let's say there's only 30 kids and you're one of them and you live outside the zone, that doesn't apply to you. That's just in zone kids. Okay, so I understand you spoke with a Queen's mom who has found a way to fought, fight back. She absolutely did, and it's one that I hadn't heard before, which is why I was really excited to speak to her and to have her share her secrets with everybody else. Great. Well, we will talk with her when we come back. <laughs> Welcome back to Accepted Secrets of New York City School Admissions with Alina Adams. I'm Victoria Chapman, and um, we've been discussing waitlisting. Now, one queen's mother, Elizabeth Fassler, when her daughter was waitlisted in their zone school in Queens, she didn't just sit back and hope that the numbers would shift in her favor. This mom, who also happens to be a lawyer, got together with other parents who were in the same boat, and they organized and took action. We'll let her explain. Hello, and welcome to Accepted Secrets of New York City School Admissions. Thank you for being with us today. You're welcome. So let's just jump right into it. Tell us about the situation you faced when you applied your daughter to kindergarten. So when we applied to kindergarten, I live in South Forest Hills, New York, and uh, we have an overcrowding issue. And um, when we applied to kindergarten, my daughter was waitlisted, along with approximately 150 other children throughout Forest Hill. It was in uh, particularly two separate schools, Mm -hmm. and our children were sent to schools um, in different neighborhoods than ours, uh, some to schools that were much lower rated which I, I don't know if so politically correct, but they were not as highly rated as the school in our neighborhood and not as good. Um, and they were in neighborhoods that were far from our, our homes. And I guess in New York City, far from our home is two miles. Right. It doesn't seem far, but it is. Mm-hmm. And there was, in many of the schools, there wasn't busing available. Right, right, because they actually also won't bu- bus kids out of district, too, so busing is a big well, issue. we were in the same district, because it's all district, uh, I want to say 28, I can't remember. Um, 
but it, they won't. Some schools would bus, and some schools won't, and all the parents got different information as to about mm-hmm. what each school would do. So we had a difference. There was a difference in that way. So it wasn't clear where your child, your child would get to school. Right. That that sounds like the DOA. Everybody called who called got a different answer to the same question. So what did you end up doing about it? So a group of parents got together in the park. We started it. There was an email chain. People who knew people and said we're meeting in the park. A group of parents met and we got together and we um, had. Luckily, we had someone who had dealt with this a few years earlier for her child in a different school in Forest Hills. There are three main elementary schools in Forest Hills, and she gave us some really good suggestions. We went to um, several of the um, board of ed meetings, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. There's a district meeting, and then there's um, something called the parents. Uh, um, uh, the PEP, which is something I can't remember, but basically we were proactive, but we weren't argumentative, we weren't saying you have to do this, we offered solutions, and so we wrote a letter, and we essentially included every single political person who was associated with our neighborhood, from starting with our local council members to all the way up to the mayor, as well as the, the senators for the state, as well as um, our United States senators, mm-hmm. we had everybody on this, this list, and we went through the education regulations, and it was helpful that several of us were lawyers, mm-hmm. and we went through the education regulations and found out that uh, the school system has an obligation to place children, to prioritize mandatory placements mm-hmm. and mandatory settings over preschool settings, and part of our issue was that there were pre-K classrooms that were established for the first time in several that took away from the kindergarten. Ah, so, so when Mayor de Blasio put in UPK, that actually made less room in the schools, is that right? It did, and what happened actually was, particularly when he made the UPK announcement, he was very specific that in central Queens, which is where I live, and in other places in Queens, that because of the overcrowding issues, they were going to have to look to community-based programs mm-hmm. for UPK. However, they decided they wanted to put them in the public schools as well. And by doing that, they eliminated classrooms for kindergarten. Mm-hmm. And so that's how it ended up to have a very long list. And so there, it was just, we were very proactive and we just kept going. We went and met with our council members. We had parents sitting and speaking and waiting to talk to the chancellor. We just really did not give up until we got a push for what we needed. And I think the biggest thing that helped us was in our letter, we offered six solutions. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you. What, what were the solutions that you offered? Well, we offered solutions like um, uh, how to prioritize how to prioritize the kindergarten children. So we said your regulations say that um, you require programs get priority. So our kids are required program because you're required in New York City to go to kindergarten. Mm-hmm. You are required the year you turn five to go to kindergarten. It is not, it is a mandatory. Right, mandatory. right. Kindergarten is mandatory. Kindergarten is mandatory now, right? Yes, it used to not be. Mm-hmm. So kindergarten was mandatory, and pre-K is not, and you have an obligation under the chancellor's rights to prioritize. And so we did that. We said, what about? Um, we said, what about? Not, we know you don't want to eliminate um, pre-K, but instead of having two classrooms, have one classroom. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had some solutions at PS. 144, their principal was very active on this in this group, and she was very strongly advocating for their – they had had a robust uh, pre-K program before, and so she was advocating for her program. And, in fact, uh, they had – she had suggested trailers uh-huh. in, to 144 in particular because they needed some work on their building and they need to expand their building. And prior to the work being done and getting more classes and more space, they wanted trailers, and we were told that wasn't an option, but in fact it was. Oh, And so, right. so 144, the, for the, this, the only school in the city, I think, where they started putting in trailers for a school year where they have eliminated those in every other, almost every other um, place in the city. And so they have trailers because they're now going to do an expansion in 144 until a building that's right next door to it, I believe. And so, but the advocacy got them to add trailers, so they got to keep their pre-K numbers and 
have all of their kindergartners get in. So your main piece of advice would for parents who are facing the same situation, so many parents were waitlisted this year as well, is to be proactive, to advocate, but to offer solutions, not to just complain. Right. You can't just say, I'm complaining, and, not, and you can't just say, you're doing the wrong thing, because no one's listening. If you're saying you're not doing your job, that doesn't go so well. So what we did was like, you can do your job, and you can do it well, and these are the ways you can do it. And it was a much more positive message. Now, we didn't have the same issue this year on Forest Hills. The wait list is much smaller this year. Mm -hmm. And so, but it's still uh, definitely very frustrating for parents when that happens. And, you know, you have parents, and I think the wait list is 25 or 30 this year, and it's only at PS 196, I believe, mm -hmm. not at PS 144, which is where, where it was a combination last year. And so these parents are very frustrated, but they, you know, they don't have the same level of involvement. I mean, we're all supportive of them, but it's hard to get a movement going when there's 25 people affected at the right. moment. Right. Well, listen, thank you so much. We really appreciate your input and your advice. And I think the message to parents is that you can do something and that a wait list isn't the end of the world. I would also say, just, just so people know that, the other thing that for these 25 parents and for other parents, the one thing you can do is wait for the, the kindergarten placements go out. And then a couple of weeks later, the gifted intelligence. Yes, yes, absolutely. There'll be so much movement in June. Yes. There's movement in June. So you really have to wait to see where the movement is before you can know what other steps to take. And it's very hard to wait. And as someone who waited, it was very hard to wait. But it all turned out okay. So you, you can be the role model for everyone who's waiting this year. Thank you. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to speak okay. to us. All right, Alina. So now that we know what some things parents can do when their children have been waitlisted for public schools, the question is what to do about private. We'll find out more on those options next week. Um, anything you want to add about the conversation? Well, one of the things I wanted to add is we've been talking about zoned schools. There are also unzoned schools. There usually are schools where a person residing in the district has as much shot of getting into the school as any other person. And there's been some misconceptions among parents. For instance, I've heard parents tell me, well, I'm just going to apply to my unzoned school because I see that they don't have a wait list. The reason you see that they don't have a wait list is because the DOE doesn't pu publish those wait lists because because no one is entitled to a seat at a zone, an unzoned school, so you either get in or you don't get in. So the fact to remember is very often a school might get 800 applications for maybe about 40 seats. Uh -huh. I just wanted to make sure that parents understood that because they didn't see a published wait list for their unzoned school, that doesn't mean it's going to be a cakewalk to get in. In fact, it's actually going to be harder because the fact of the matter is any child who resides in the district has as much of a shot at that school as any other child. Any particular tricks that differ? The process to working the wait list at an unzoned school is the same as at a zoned school, except that as we heard in the interview, when you approach a school about kids that they're entitled of that they're you are entitled to a seat there and they have to take, that doesn't apply to an unzoned school. So the tricks we just heard about the zoned school wouldn't apply to an unzoned school. Okay. All right, now, where are you going to be next? Um, I understand that getting into New York City kindergarten, again, has been updated for 2017. So I want to remind them about the book and any workshops? I do. I actually have workshops coming up all this month. So please go to my website, www.alina.com. Alina. I'm going to try that again because apparently I don't even know my own website name. It's www.alinaadams.com and you can go there and I have the listings of all of my upcoming workshops so that you can register for one and hear even more from me in person instead of on the air. Sounds like you're going to be busy for the next month and a half. Absolutely. I'm hoping to have things going right up until the end of June so that all parents can get prepared for the fall. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Lena. Next week we're going to be talking about Options for trying to get off that wait list in the private schools. Okay, we'll see you next week.